Welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, this is the, um, what is it, Operating Jenkins at Scale. Uh, I'm Ryan Campbell. Um, let my par partner introduce himself here in a minute. Um, I'm a CloudBees engineer. I've worked for CloudBees for four years, uh, previously on Devit Cloud, our hosted Jenkins service, and I currently work on the Jenkins Operations Center product. So Robert, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Robert Sandell, but everyone calls me Bobby from IRC and stuff. You can see me as R. Sandell. I've been working for CloudBees for one month and 20, what is it, 23 days? I joined in the 1st of September. Um, I've been a contributor to the Jenkins project since 2010. My first plugin was the Go Trigger plugin. Uh, and I worked quite a lot with uh, the maintenance and development of the Jenkins installations at Sony Mobile before I joined CloudBees. Cool. All right. Uh, this is a sponsored talk, so I do get to tell you a little bit about what we do, um, and, but I'll keep it brief, just to CloudBees in a minute. Um, we provide uh, support for Jenkins, and so that means just engineer to engineer. If you have a problem with Jenkins, we will help you come up with a solution or we will solve it for you. Um, so that's all done via email and so forth. Uh, we also provide a set of enterprise plugins called Jenkins Enterprise, and that helps you kind of secure and manage and um, scale your your Jenkins um, instance. And then we also provide this kind of newer product called Jenkins Operations Center, some of which we're going to show you here today. And that lets you take, you know, if you have a large organization with lots of Jenkins instances, um, which hopefully most of you have, you can then uh, centralize the management and monitoring of those install installations and do things like share slaves between those instances and so forth. So we'll, we'll tell you a little more about, about that today. And then we also have a hosted online version of Jenkins called Devit Cloud. And so that's you know, where you can basically, without having to be a sysadmin, you can get a Jenkins instance up and running and run all your builds in the cloud without um, owning any of the servers. So that's CloudBees in a minute. Um, so I, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to all of you. Because if you're here, that means that you're probably the new owner of a large Jenkins cluster. And <laughs> And maybe, uh, maybe, or maybe you expect to be so soon, because that's what we're going to be talking about here, is not only do you have maybe one Jenkins master with um, many slaves, but now you're starting to see many Jenkins masters, and you're, um, and you're starting to try to figure out the problems there. And maybe you're feeling a little bit like, like this girl here, that you think, OK, great, I've got all these Jenkins instances. And now, suddenly, the slide is going a lot faster than I thought it would be, and um, I've got to figure out how to get a handle on this. Um, and so that's what we want to help you with today. Um, and there's like three basic problems that, well, that I can think of right now with scaling Jenkins Masters. One is, is monitoring, and the other is management, and the other is, I guess, like configuration management. We're going to talk about the first two and leave configuration management to the puppet and chef guys, um, but we're going to focus on those first two here. Okay, so um, I want to talk br briefly a bit about um, what we mean by monitoring, uh, and I think the kind of the uh, the key question that if you're managing these multiple Jenkins masters, you want to know in a consistent and regular way, like is my Jenkins healthy? So uh, you want to know is it reachable? Of course, obviously. Um, but more than that, is it uh, functional? So are users getting errors? Are there bugs they're exper experiencing? And is it performant? So is it responding quickly enough, and are there enough resources? So, and, and if it's not, you want to know as soon as possible uh, to the contrary so that you can start to investigate. But then when you start this investigation, you want as much information as you can at your fingertips, um, and you want it in a consistent way so that if you're on group A's Jenkins server and group B's Jenkins server, that you can access that information in a single and consistent way. And that you have like, you know, like a wealth of information so that you know, when Jenkins is down, you don't want to have to be typing commands at the terminal to see what um, is low, but you want to have ideally some kind of dashboard that tells you right away what the problem is. And so that's, that I, th I think, a second critical part of monitoring is, is, the, um, is the metrics display and query. And then I'd like to, helpfully as a vendor, stretch the definition of monitoring to include this idea of analytics, that not only do I care if I'm in the, the, the Jenkins team, and may, I don't know, some of you, is anyone in engineering ops or a similar team like that? 
where maybe like you're, okay, a few, where you're like this centralized team that's responsible for these, these engineering tools. And, and so you know, you, the teams are starting to centralize that. And so you want to know not only is Jenkins working, but what kind of business value is it delivering? And, and what kind of increasing business value is being delivered so that I can help justify you know, what, what investments we need to make into our Jenkins services to make them even better. And so you know, we want to see the trends in usage. We want to see how Jenkins is being used across our organization uh, to help us better understand where that investment is needed. OK. But first, before we get to the, um, to the, the demo, and that's what I mostly have for you is kind of a demonstration of, of what we're talking about here, I want to talk about what you could do without Jenkins Operations Center. And I think that there are a lot of great options out there for the do-it-yourself type especially if you have you know, a team of folks who um, have some experience with these tools. There's a lot of great things out there that you can use to kind of build this yourself. And so I want to describe a, a um, kind of reference implementation of that for you. I'm not going to show it to you, but, um, but these are some things to Google and maybe understand later. But there, there are three parts to this. And I kind of mentioned it before. So we have stats collection. Um, and we're going to talk about CollectD for that. We have graphing, which is uh, graphite is kind of an implementation of that, and then notifications with Nagios. So this is what it might look like if you were doing it yourself. Uh, you would likely um, install CollectD, which CollectD is basically this agent that sits on a host, and it uh, looks at all the various subsystems, has tons of plugins, a lot like Jenkins, and it um, can talk to various resources and see, okay, what, how much disk is available, how much CPU is being used, and, and so forth. And then it can store that or it can transmit it. And so what's interesting about that then is that there's actually a, a Graphite plugin for CollectD. And so um, you can tell CollectD to send all of those metrics over to Graphite. And Graphite is just basically this uh, like metrics database that can display this time series data and let you look at it in different, um, different time scales. So that's great. And then you can use Nagios to look at both CollectD and Graphite to get an idea if some of those metrics, obviously, disk space is getting used up, or um, load is too high over some sustained period. And interestingly, you can have Nagios look at, talk to Graphite, and Graphite has some great capabilities for, um, for filtering out noisy data, for example, um, or uh, telling you if you're pr kind of predicting where something's going to go, so predicting that you're going to run out of disk space in some time period, perhaps. Um, so, so those are some things to look at, um, and those are kind of the the, uh, the trinity, I suppose, of the open source monitoring world. So, oh, I'm about to go on too quickly. Let me, let me step back. Uh, so I, I told you about um, the um, gra I'm sorry, Collect D, but I, there's this other tool that I want you to know about, um, this other plugin in um, open source Jenkins, completely open source, called the Metrics plugin. And so I want to give a shout out to uh, Stephen Connolly for putting this together. But what this does is it takes a great kind of core library called the Drop Wizard Metrics uh, library. You, anybody using Drop Wizard Metrics? Come on. Let's hear it. Oh, man. You don't know what you're missing. So basically, Coda Hale, you should Google this guy. Um, there's, he has a great YouTube talk about, about metrics and about basically we should be measuring everything. Um, and so that you know, we don't know what data we're going to need until we're in production. And so he's a real big advocate of, of measuring everything. And he built this great library to make it really easy. And so this provides some basic abstractions. So if you're writing application code, this is what you would use. Um, so it has like uh, counters and gauges, histograms, timers, and meters, and all these great APIs. And then it puts it all in this registry for you, or at least the, the Jenkins plugin does. And so then other plugins can contribute metrics into this. Um, and so you, the idea, the goal here, what I'm evangelizing is that plugin developers um, and even internal plugin developers should be adding metrics to this so that we get this great, rich um, set of Jenkins metrics so we can understand better about what's going on inside of Jenkins. Um, and I, I guess I should say, like, just to give you an idea, what, what would you measure inside of Jenkins? Well, you, know, you can measure the number of jobs, the number of slaves, um, the number of builds going on at a given time, that sort of thing. You get the idea. There's a lot of data in there, and we just need a way to pull it out. And so that's what this metrics plugin also does. Um, and so you can integrate this with Graphite um, uh, and have it report to Graphite. And you can also have like Nagios pull a servlet that this um, plugin exposes. So a lot of great options in do-it-yourself, uh, and, and you should definitely look into that. But 
I want to kind of show you what we're, we're looking at, what's going on in the open source world at, at CloudBees, and looking at, you know, we come to these conferences, and we see people taking these, these new and innovative approaches, and we want to we um, shrink wrap that, <laughs> basically. Uh, we we want to make that easy for other people to consume without having to go, each of us go and do it over and over again by, on our own. So that is why um, I'm going to show you this demo of where we are. This is uh, hot off the presses, so if it breaks, I was just working on it this week. <laughs> so uh, give me a little mercy, but um, it, it shouldn't be that bad. Uh, so let's, this, um, let's take a look at Jenkins Operations Center. Uh, this what pr it looks probably familiar to you. Basically, it's, it's a Jenkins instance. Um, and uh, all that we see here, instead of jobs, what we see is a, um, what we call a client master. So it's basically a way for um, you to kind of organize all these uh, multiple masters. You can put these in folders and that sort of thing. And, and you connect them up to this Jenkins Operations Center. And so we can click into this and kind of see, uh, OK, this is a, a normal working Jenkins instance trying to do what it's going to do for its um, particular business unit. Um, and those builds are going on. And so it's, it's being managed by this Operations Center. So we're going to go back up to the Operations Center and look at this level. And by virtue of connecting this Jenkins master into this um, Jenkins Operations Center, we get some, a great view of what the, um, the metrics are inside. And this is coming from that metrics plugin I told you about earlier. And so we get from this, hopefully you can see this pretty well, we get some, some basic information about the, the internal state of Jenkins. So we get the, the heat memory used over time, um, non-heat memory. We get to see you know, how busy is the, um, the system as a whole versus how busy is the JVM, and then even, even into the um, builds in the queue or the, um, the executor count. So we just have two executors you saw earlier, so that's pretty, pretty normal. And, uh, and then HTTP requests per minute. And I'm showing you maybe like um, a, a fourth of the metrics available. This, this dashboard is still kind of in progress, but you get an idea for, for what we have available. It's basically what is the state of the system right now or in the recent past. Um, and so what's nice about this is this is going into, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but this is going into an Elasticsearch database, um, and we're using Kibana to visualize this. So by virtue of using Kibana, we're able to look at this data in different time spans. So right now it's the last five minutes, but I can also scale out to look at the last hour just as easily as I can scale out to look at the past two days and kind of see, OK, I've got a, a big trend now. Is that normal for this time of day? That's often what you want to know, is to look at the information in context and look at it over time to understand where your true variations are. And then being able to zoom in, I can highlight a section here. Let me do that. I can highlight a section and zoom into a particular um, time span pretty easily. So uh, that is uh, the metrics uh, capability. And there's a lot here that I want to show you, but I'm running short on time, so I'm going to have to um, uh, speed on here. I will say that there, what, is, what you don't see here is perhaps um, w uh, additional overlays of this information. Because it's, it's nice to know what the heap is, but there's probably several things that the heap correlates with. And so we wa will want to show you that as well, is this, um, this capability to um, overlay uh, other information. So here we have our, our single Jenkins master over the past, let's do it for the past 15 minutes. And so I told you earlier about adding a node. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what's cool about this? So one is that it's all going into an Elasticsearch backend. So I mentioned that before. What does that mean? Well, Elasticsearch is basically this, um, this multi-tenanting document index. Uh, what does that mean? It's, it's basically kind of like a NoSQL database. And so we're throwing these metric reports in there. And what's nice about it is that you can easily scale this. So out of the box, we build in Elasticsearch, so you don't have to configure that. But then you can, as your data volume grows or your searches grow, you can add additional um, nodes to that pretty easily. And so uh, that's all done by Elasticsearch, and it manages the data in that grid, and you don't have to. Um, that's really what that means. Um, and then uh, what's also nice about this is that it's pure Java, so there's no um, other packages you have to install on any of your Jenkins masters. It's just all you need is the, the Jenkins Operation Center plugin, and all this data appears once you connect this to the Jenkins. Um, so I'm going to show you real quick about how that works, and so we can see the, the new data. So we've got client one here. I've also got, I'm going to create a new item, and we're going to call this really creatively client two. 
And we'll call it, it's a client master, that's what it is. So it's a client to this Jenkins Operations Center. And we'll click OK. And then uh, we'll say, oh, we really want to have monitoring. We're going to require monitoring to be reported. So let's press Save. And so, uh, so I've got some connection details. So I'm just going to connect it. I'm going to tell it where this master resides and push the configuration to it and agree to join that, that cluster. We'll wait here. And so what's happening is basically this uh, Jenkins master is, is joining the Gen Jenkins Operations Center and, and checking the configuration to make sure everything is, uh, is on the up and up. And uh, great, so here's, this is our second one, our second Jenkins master. This is where we run our, our OS 10 builds, okay? So we have an OS 10 uh, build on here. But anyway, it's just another Jenkins instance now. And we go back up to our Jenkins master and we see we have client one and client two. But what's great about this now is that our metrics are now being automatically updated. And so you can see the new metrics displaying for client two as well. And so I get kind of this global view of kind of the status of these different metrics and uh, being able to um, zoom, in, zoom, out, zoom in on them and um, isolate them. So we'll provide some controls to let you look at uh, subgroups of these, but th that's the, the basic idea. Um, so now I, I want to show you one other feature of um, this dashboard. We, we want to give you not only the capability to use our embedded dashboards, but also to create your own. And so we're relying upon Kibana for that. Kibana is a part of the Elasticsearch uh, tool chain, basically. And it's, um, Kibana is a JavaScript application that basically sits in front of Elasticsearch and allows you to um, create dashboards. And these dashboards are all issuing queries back to Elasticsearch that's running inside of Jenkins Operations Center. And so you can basically uh, come in here and create your own kind of dashboard. So we, um, we can click the, down here, we can click the Add Panel button, and we can create what kind of panel type we want. So we've got a lot of histograms, but we might want to have um, uh, some spark lines, stats tables, and so forth. Um, and so let's here, let's create a table, uh, right? And so we'll call it events. Um, and, uh, and so we can save that. And, oh, well, we should have made it a little bit bigger here. So let's, um, let's make this a span of 12. And so we can kind of see the, the raw data that's behind this query. So that's, um, that's an example of what you can do. So we, we want this to be a very flexible tool so that you can create these dashboards across your organization and share them. Um, so that is uh, where we are going with monitoring um, of like these, these kind of core system metrics to help you understand what's going on inside your Jenkins. Uh, in addition to that, not only do we have this monitoring data being submitted, but we also have um, build data being submitted. So if we go back to these, um, these Jenkins masters, you know, this client one has been humming along here, kind of doing all these builds. And as it's doing that, it is uh, sending a copy of that build up to Jenkins Operations Center. And Jenkins Operations Center is storing that in an index that we can then, um, well, storing that in an archive that we can index, much like a search engine might index it. In fact, a lot of organizations like GitHub and Yelp, they use Elasticsearch as a, as a search engine. And so that's kind of what we're building into uh, Jenkins Operations Center here, so that now, um, because those builds are in here, we can look at uh, visualizations of that build data over time. And so not only can we see like these kind of um, uh, gauges and histograms and that sort of thing, but, but the actual build data itself. So here's why that's interesting. Um, I'm looking at basically all of the runs. Uh, let's see, let's look at the runs for the past, uh, yeah, past seven days maybe. Um, and so I can see this broken down in different ways. Um, can you see this very well? Say no if you can't. I'll see, let me see if I can kind of improve this situation. Okay, well, that may be as good as it's gonna get. But, so this build history, this is, if you think of the build history um, icon in Jenkins, right, that lets you see the build history for that particular Jenkins. And you can generally like scroll that back a little ways and kind of see what's been going on. But this is more of, of that similar kind of functionality, but on the, the global scale of your entire organization. And so we can see across all of our Jenkins masters, broken down by the most popular build labels, where the builds are occurring. So here we've got it broken down by Windows, Linux, and OS 10. And so kind of similarly, we can also zoom into this and see over time, and here's why this might be interesting is, uh, so you need to schedule maintenance. 
you're managing all of these uh, Jenkins instances, and when is a good time to do an, up an upgrade? Well, one way to know that is look at yesterday's weather and look at what are the usage patterns. When's the best time to schedule downtime that would least be the least interruptive to my um, teams? And then uh, likewise, I can see um, a build duration is another kind of metric that we collect. And so this is in minutes here. And so I can, uh, I can highlight some of these. Well, that doesn't look too bad. But this guy looks pr pretty problematic here. So I might zoom in and try to understand you know, why, um, why I'm seeing a huge spike in, in build duration. Um, and, and correspondingly, I can look at the builds that now fall into that range and kind of see, oh, yep, that doesn't look quite right. And I can maybe do some analysis to understand that better. Um, but you, honestly, most of this stuff, it, it's not useful until you have a problem. But when you do have a problem, it's great to have the data to be able to analyze it better. Um, and so let me just zoom out and show you this last graph here, um, which is the, the time in queue. And I think this is pretty important, especially for you engineering ops guys, um, that when you are looking at where is my bottleneck, when you see a spike in this time in queue right here, it means that a build has been waiting in the queue before it can execute. And so in this case, we've got a build waiting for 165 minutes. Um, boy, I can't do math right now. That's almost like three hours. And so, um, so that means some developer is waiting on that, or some team. And if you see this growing over time, that means you've got a trend of increasing build queue times. And that right there, my friends, is a budget argument, right? This is a, this is a foundation to, to argue to, for, for management saying, we clearly have increasing build times in the Windows builds. We need more build, um, Windows executors. And you've got the data there to back you up. Um, and so just a few more of these controls. We're going to provide different ways for you to kind of slice this and dice this. Um, you can see the, the builds by a result. So we got a 75% success rate. We might want to um, be able to be notified when that slips down. If we all of a sudden um, all of our builds are failing, then um, this, this dashboard will be able to tell you that. And then likewise, breaking down our, our um, labels. We can click on this and just, for instance, see all of the, the Windows builds across our organization. And, um, and this, this gives us different ways to um, understand that. And then breaking it down by, by master as well. So if we remove that last one, then we can see, OK, here's client one and client two. I just want to look at the, the client two builds. I can do that. Um, so I think that I've showed you um, pretty much everything I wanted to show you. I guess what I'd say is that this is still early days. There's a whole lot of data inside of Jenkins. And it's, it's going on all the time. And we're, we're going to be increasingly capturing it and coming up with novel ways to display it so that you can have a better understanding of how your organization is using, using Jenkins and what's going on inside. So that's the end of my part. I'm going to hand it over to Bobby now. And the way to do that. Uh, you still have the presentation on your own. OK. Um, are you going to do your demo? Oh, yes, you're right. I, I'm doing this too early. <laughs> Sorry. I got carried away. Let's see if I can get back in business here. All right. I think we're lucky. All right. Um, and LibreOffice crashes right when I do that. That's, that's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> um, so let me see if I can get, convince it to open back up. Ugh. All right. Let's see what happens here. I'm sure it's fine, everybody. Don't get worried. We're uh, on our way. Well, I'm worried. <laughs> so um, that's not the one. Boy, hope we can find it. All right. I think we almost got it here. All right. So I'm going to hand it back to you now that I have recovered. There we go. OK. Thank you. So, how many watched Andrew's uh, talk this morning about seven habits? And, ah, good. You know everything I'm going to say then. Almost. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to do a quick recap of my talk from last year's conference here um, about how, how we sort of handled it at, at so many where my where I previously worked. Uh, so as, as you start to grow your single Jenkins instance, you start to, to need to come to terms with certain things. Uh, you know, Jenkins is starting to become quite critical to your delivery pipeline. 
so one of the things you probably should start to think about if you haven't done that already is uh, who's actually responsible for what? Um, if Jenkins goes down, or who, who is the one that we need to point to and tell them to, to take it up again? I mean, it could be the IT department, or they might just be responsible for the server, the hardware itself, running. Uh, is it you? Is it someone else? Or should you shove that over to the IT department? Stuff like that. Something you need to, to, to think about and know who to blame when things are not working. Things, uh, the whole way, but once you, once you have grown quite large, you start to understand that you want to automate as much as possible. I mean, you're automating your delivery pipeline. Why not automate the maintenance of, your, of Jenkins as much as possible as well? Backup, given, I hope. Um, having scripts, looking at if you have enough disk space. Uh, Jenkins itself has. Um, a, monitoring for, for disk space and can uh, disconnect the slave if it doesn't have enough. But that might not be the way you want, you might want to make sure that your slaves always have enough disk space. So looking into those kinds of things that you want to automate. Uh, keeping your masters and your slaves sane or using metrics, uh, finding out if if, you're, if they are insane at the moment, and maybe even handling that some way. Uh, build failure analyzer plugin, for example, uh, is one of those that can help you with that. Uh, looking into build logs and detecting things you know can go wrong with the slaves and, and quickly uh, notifying yourself about that. Automating your upgrades. It's also something that you, you might want to have a human being actually doing the upgrade, but there is a lot of things that you can automate around it. Like if you have a downtime at four o'clock in the morning, you could sleep in if you can automate a bit around that. Putting it in shutdown mode for two hours before actually shutting down and stuff like that could be automated quite easily. And Andrew mentioned this as well. Make sure that you keep yourself on an LTS and don't install plugins that you think are cool just because they look cool. Actually, choose them with care and upgrade when you know they are working. And you can do this by using a staging environment. It's probably the easiest way. Okay, so now we want to add more masters. That adding one more master could be done for various reasons. You might think you have too many jobs. So dividing, divide and conquer way of sort of getting better performance out of Jenkins is taking half of the jobs, putting them on another master. You might be, want to be experimenting a bit with plugins, but you are not really sure if they will work or not. Uh, there might be a new team coming along and they don't want to share. Um, I'll say you're probably fine here. Just take all that fine automated things you had on, on the previous master, copy them over, and you're safe. Uh, that, at least what I think. Uh, maybe put your maintenance stuff into a source code management system if you haven't done that already. But more masters. One for each department. You might have skunk work projects, uh, what have you. Uh, one master per job? I don't know. Uh, now you start to see that maintenance is multiplying quite quickly. You start to have um, people just doing Jenkins maintenance. Uh, all those nice scripts you had that worked on one master and two masters, you probably need to rewrite those now to better manage things. And how you can do this are varies in different ways. You need some type of infrastructure at least. You puppet guys or chef can probably solve this quite easily. You already might have the infrastructure. Um, but this was a this kind of hard problem to solve. And I would like to take one crack at it uh, with what we call Jen bulk operations for Jenkins Operations Center. 
And the idea about uh, bulk operations is that uh, we can sort of do maintenance related tasks on the masters and run those from one central place, which w would be jockey. And now I'll see if I can actually get my demo working from my machine. Whoa, it didn't crash. <laughs> okay, so this is, again, similar. I have uh, two masters connected, uh, just to show off. This is Jenkins Operation Center. I have a folder in here that I call dev, so these are sort of the dev masters on, uh, that, that I placed here. Uh, two masters, master one and master two, very conveniently named. and. Here is an operation that we can run on those. So these are just simple or similar ways that you would do a, a normal job. Uh, quick look at it. Choosing to work on all the masters from the operation center route. Uh, I have a couple of steps that I'm doing. Um, a Groovy script, of course, you if you're doing cool maintenance, you need to be able to do Groovy scripts. So that's the first thing. Um, my idea here is that you could you, you, printing out to the Jenkins master log like a mark saying that now we're going in to do some do something here. The next step then is uh, preparing master for shutdown. That is the quiet down that you can do under the maintenance page normally, and then some Groovy script more just because Groovy is Groovy. Uh, and if we now run this, we can see that it actually ran just as if it would have run on a slave. These are actually run on, run on the master. We can see that they were successful. If we look at the log, we can see, okay, it's preparing for shutdown. It's writing out hello world. Uh, going to this master, now we can do an update and see that it's actually preparing to shut down. Similar with master 2 as well. This is kind of the, the, the simple way, let's say it's the, uh, the uh, first week after the second Tuesday of the month. You Microsoft people knows that probably about that day. Uh, patch Tuesday and you've spent all week uh, testing that everything is working, and uh, then it's Friday and or Saturday, and you are going to to do the upgrades. You can schedule this type of job to start off at four in the morning, and then you come in at eight, and all the builds are done, and no nothing else is running, and you can restart safely. Uh, taking a bit deeper look at what we can do here. Uh, so. This operations tab is, you can do operations on different kinds of things. At this moment, we're doing operations on a master. The source is where to select, this is a bit different from where you normally run on a slave, when you select a label you want to run on. Here we are sort of collecting in a different way. So we start at, we select to start at operations and to root. We can send it in as a parameter we can say that this project's parent, so currently we are in the dev folder, so running from the project parent would mean that we will run on all the masters in the dev folder, for example. Um, or we can run on all the masters that are connected to a specific update center. Uh, we can add some filters to this, so in path, for example, uh, let's say uh, that we are doing something like that. So that would mean that if we go from operation center root, we will take, pick all the masters that are direct descendants of a folder called dev. So if you want to run specific things on dev versus staging, or if you want to run dev versus test, or depending on your topology, you can select different filters here. 
if you only want to run on online, some, some steps later on needs an online slave, or if it should wait, and stuff like that. And then we have steps that are normal that, that you might think of see as build steps. We have the execute Groovy, prepare for shutdown, and uh, some other things we have. Uh, running backups, so you can make one operation that is running backup on each master, so you don't have a back, need to have a backup job on every single master. Um, prepare for shutdown, do a restart, do a safe restart. The difference is that safe restart will restart only when there are no jobs running. Restart will actually restart directly. Uh, as I said, we can also do operations on other things, for example, on update centers. So if you have an update center defined in, in, uh, in JOC, we can sort of select to run different kinds of things on the update centers, uh, like remove a plugin from the update center, promote a core version. You might have done the testing and now it's okay. So we want to say that this core version is okay to use across all the update centers. Uh, promote a plugin saying that this plugin version is okay to use now. Um, do a pull of everything. So if you have, if you have uh, the open source update center as an upstream, you can sort of pull down all those and, and, and load them locally. Um, refresh the metadata, things like that. Upload a plugin, upload a core version bit of different types of steps. And then afterwards that we have done these, let's say you upload a plugin, you promote it, and then you sort of say, do a safe restart on all the masters that are using that update center, for example. Mm -hmm. And my time is running out. Um, another thing that we are adding here is a way to do ad hoc bulk operations. So, I can select maybe these two masters. You see the bulk operations menu here. I can select and do a prepare for shutdown or a safe restart. We will add more here as, as time comes. Uh, maybe upload a plugin or something. Run a backup now. We, there will be things added here as time goes on. Uh, yeah. Did I forget anything, Ryan? No, I think you covered it. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll call it a wrap. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>